I played from start. Oh well. So I, I think the important concepts that we talked about um, is that uh, in magnetospheres, and just to review, that that a simple you start with this very simple MHD equation, which really involves force balance or pressure balance, and that that the ram pressure, which is rho u squared, plus the particle pressure plus the magnetic field pressure all remain constant. Okay, just because you could take the Navier-Stokes equation and just show that, that that leads to, under certain circumstances, this, this conservation. This is a steady state static equation. And the one thing that's missing out of this, that if you ever use it, you should be careful. We threw away the magnetic tension curve. So if you ever see a bet magnetic field, this thing can't really be used because magnetic tension is going to uh, influence it. You could put magnetic tension in, but it's very, very difficult. All right, so we talked about the, the three regions um, in, in the subsolar region where, where, by, where is the pointer? It's got to be somewhere here. Here it is. Find a computer. Whereby in the solar wind, it's almost entirely dominated by the, the um, ram pressure. And then this is dominated primarily by particle pressure. The magneto sheath is dominated by primarily by particle pressure. But there's a little ram and magnetic field pressure. But then when you get to the Earth's magnetosphere, we once again are singly dominated by almost entirely mag um, uh, magnetic field pressure, except for in Jupiter where there is some particle pressure. And that um, because of that, we can uh, make a formula that balances the pressure uh, between the Earth's magnetosphere and the solar wind ram pressure and find out the standoff point of magnetospheres. And I think uh, um, uh, Fran Baganol showed a number of excellent you know, ways that this actually works fairly well at the Earth and at almost all the planets. So this is our, our standoff. And realize this is only coming out of what? A, a, a really simple equation. Okay, But it's giving us sort of a big idea of what we're dealing with. So I, I emphasize this a lot. When you do science, you always make approximations at first to see you're going to find in life that half your ideas, well, unless you're really good, 99% of your ideas end up being thrown out, right? That's essentially what happens to me is you get an idea and you write it on a piece of envelope, on the back of an envelope or a napkin or do some really quick calculation. Ah, oh, this really didn't work. Okay, that's how you test your ideas. You don't test them with the experiment right away. You know, all that stuff you learn, you know, whatever, you know. Get an idea, make an experiment to test. No, you first do the laugh test on it. If it doesn't pass the laugh test, you're not going to get an experiment until a long time later. It has to pass a lot of tests first. Uh, we talked about the role of the shock being uh, uh, um, compressing the plasma. It is a permeable barrier, meaning the plasma goes right through this. So it's just some imaginary barrier that we're drawing in our mind. There's really nothing there. But all of a sudden, the plasma will slow down. It's the only thing that goes down. Its density goes way up. The magnetic field goes way up. And the um, uh, temperature goes way up. There's pressure balance across the shock. There must be, okay, by definition. So the pressure doesn't really change. It just shifts the players from um, primarily ram pressure to particle pressure, typically. OK, it could be magnetic field to pressure, too, depending. So you have shocks everywhere. You have shocks on supernova shells, for example. The supernova shell shock is plowing into the interstellar medium after the explosion. There is a balance of ram pressure, typically, with magnetic field pressure on a lot of these because of the magnetic field build up. But it's just changing the, the main players. The magnetopause, on the other hand, is an impenetrable barrier. OK, we talked about quasi-perp and quasi-parallel shocks and how they look in interstellar medium. Then we talked about the magnetopause, which is the next barrier in. So you have the regions, the solar wind, the, the boundary, the shock, 
the next region, the magneto sheath, another boundary, the magneto pause, and then inside of that is the magnetosphere. Particle pressure, pressure, total pressure is balanced all the way through. That's important thing to remember. But the magnetosphere to zeroth order, not counting the mixing we can get from reconnection, now we know we can mix, is its own plasma environment. It gives, it's, in, it's plasma is primarily from Earth. It's oxygen and hyd singly charged oxygen and hydrogen, a little bit of singly charged helium in there, and some other stuff. You know, comes off the top of Earth, um, and it basically is primarily a magnetic field. It's very, very low density in there, so that that pressure balance is maintained. But this boundary, the magnetopause, can have magnetic reconnection. Okay, if we have magnetic reconnection, all of a sudden, a lot of the physics, the understanding we have on the large scale, due to this tiny little scale, you know, as I said, it's the end causing the avalanche, a lot changes our view of things. We now can get energy entry into the uh, en energy and um, particles could go right through this boundary now. It's no longer impermeable. Okay, we, we've opened up the field lines and the particles could travel along the field lines. So, um, now we talked a lot about this and you've heard a lot about this diffusion region, which is the region right here where the reconnection happens. In this region, the particles can no longer be frozen in because they have to jump from field line, one field line to another. They can't just stay on their field line particularly in the center. And um, that means that our equation of frozen in particles, that's where this equation really comes from. This is frozen in. Basically, if E plus V cross B equals zero, which is the zero order equation, that, you know, that, that particles are really frozen into the, into the field line. We know there's a lot of ways to break this. And so we have to understand, what we want to understand is, is how this is broken. It's easy enough to put in a resistivity uh, in certain, some reasons, particularly laboratory plasmas, because you have collisions going on. But in the Earth's magnetopause, and in many astrophysical situations, we just don't have enough collisions to justify. The speed of reconnection is, by the way, 12 orders of magnitude faster than it would be if you just relied on collisions. So even for an astrophysicist, 12 orders of magnitude is too much. Okay? I mean, heck, factor two. Ah, we wave, wave, wave our hands and say, that's in the details. We'll figure that out. But 12 orders of magnitude, you better start with a whole new idea. Okay? So um, that's where, that was the holy grail of reconnection, is that what is supporting this electric field Okay, because uh, B goes to zero in the center of it, and there's, you're left with an E, and, and, and if there's no eta, what is supporting, what's the other side of that equation? What is supporting the electric field? That equation has to be balanced somewhere there. So you can see right in the center, in this region where B goes to zero, E is not equal to zero, okay? But, but hold a second, hold a second, how, how do you, What's, what's, what's on the other side of that equation? E has to be equal to something. Okay, we can't just have an electric field sitting there. It's a good question you asked, what makes it, but the reason we have this electric field in this region, in, 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 that we purport there's electric field in there, is that if you take a look at the flow here, E is in the board and B is in this direction, so if you go E cross B, your flow is downward. Down here, B is in the opposite direction, so your flow is upward. Here, B is in kind of in the north south, you know, Z direction. I guess you call that Z. Um, so the 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 uh, flow is outward. Here, E is also in this direction to have flow outward. Because the curl of of, of E has to be zero, we, we're steady state situation here. You've got to have an electric field in there. It'd be nice if we could just throw it away, but we can't, not without a curl. You, you build up B forever. So um, that means the holy grail of, of designing these things, 
turned out to be down to how can you support this electric field in that center. Now, as I said, there's, there's Hall terms. We, we, we kick back. I'm going to go through this quickly. But this, this generalized Ohm's law turned out to be what people concentrated on. Because if you do it precisely, we could start including all the terms. Now we actually have a term that says we have to have some sort of charge separation now. We're looking for this, saying, again, MHD is an approximation. So first we just say you could do B there. But now we're saying that can't be anymore. We want to find out what's going on here. You understand? We want to find out. So we're adding back all the terms we threw away and said, oh, they're small. We're going to throw those away. You could do that. That's OK to do that. But it's always, but you always have to be honest with yourself and say, hey, this doesn't, I threw away a term that may be important, so I'm going to bring it back. And that's what we're doing here. We're bringing back the terms that we threw away. And we found out that the Hall term, which is J plus B, is very important for the ion diversion. And that this electron pressure term and inertia term, well, we don't have a direct time derivative. So we really suspected it was this electron pressure term. And, but we couldn't understand how you could infinitely build up pressure along an axis. OK, so that was one of the, um, um, I'm going to skip through the MMS introduction, and now talk to you about this, this whole idea of, let's see if I could find one, um, the um, crescents. Because when I, I, that's what I started drawing here, because I saw a lot of blank stairs and the whole idea of an off-diagonal pressure term. So prepare yourself. This is this morning's brain damage. OK, so I'm going to give you a little brain damage on this. OK, so the problem is we have this electric field. I can't remember which direction it is. Let me see. If B is this way and E is that way, or velocity. So, so E has to be upward. OK, so I'll draw this in blue. OK, now what I have here, and this is 3D, so you've got to get into 3D thinking here. This is a plane of reconnection. You see that? I try to draw this in 3D. So I'm showing you a projection, you know, a slice of a, a reconnection. This is looking at it from the top again in this way, but this is at a lower point. And they are connected. That's the X line. It's a line. So in this diagram here, this is the X line, and you're seeing the reconnection. Correct? I mean, that's, but I'm drawing this in 3D. So I'm turning them and flattening them out. Does everybody get this? So what happens is when an electron enters this region where B is close to 0, and it doesn't have to be 0. It's just that E over B greater than C, that if E over B is greater than C, you could do the math on this yourself, you'll see the electron will free fall. It means it's freely accelerated. It's no longer gyrating. It's no longer going to drift. It is going to free fall. So in this tiny region, in the electron diffusion region, where B is nearly 0, or B doesn't have to be 0. It's just the, 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 the in-plane component of B is 0. You can have a guide field. That means E dot B is not equal to 0. So it's a parallel electric field. But, but the point is that in this region, this is where we want to balance that equation. That's it. We're trying to, you know, it's OK to say oh, there's a singularity there. But that's not really the case. I, we hate singularities. So we're saying, what happens in here? How do you balance this equation? So I'm going to try to draw this. Electron are frozen in as they, well, what color is an electron? Red? The, what, in my day, electrons were always green. And that's because we had CRTs. You know, those big old things. Remember those, those things? And they always came up green. And so the electron beams always made green lines. So electrons are green. OK, and then ions were always red. Um, but you guys have to be, you know, so everybody paper I see, ions are, are green and electrons are red. And that drives me nuts. OK, this is a little silly point. But my electrons are going to be red. This is very much against everything I learned. OK, um, so what happens is if an electron's wandering in toward this region, just E cross B drifting and floating around, doing its thing, it gets into this free fall region, and the electric field's this way. They're negatively charged, so they're going to fall down this way, right? 
So the electron starts getting accelerated in this region. Okay. Um, the key to understanding reconnection, collisionless reconnection, is that electron can only spend a finite time in that region because it came in with some perp perpendicular velocity. It still has it. It doesn't lose it. So it's going to then come out of this region here, maybe on this side, maybe on that side, maybe somewhere. It really doesn't matter how it comes out. But it moves back into the region where there's, there's a finite magnetic field and starts gyrating again. So it only spends a finite amount of time in that region. And this is the important part. So it picks up momentum. So you have um, um, rho, um, the momentum, um, mv, is approximately EDT, right? I, I'm just being, the, the, where delta t is the time. These things do not show up very well in the back of the room. This is E delta T. Where delta T is the time, oh, E, E, delta T. There's, an there's a constant here. And there's a minus sign, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, the, 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 the point I'm making is it spends a finite amount of time. So it gains momentum in, what do I call this, the Z direction? Is this the, here, where's on the He's not here. I need a simulator because simulators, we always call this the z direction mag, along the magnetic field, but theorists, I think, call this the y. That's the y direction. That's right. Um, it really doesn't matter. Let's call this z. Um, in this direction, that's where it's gaining the momentum. You see that? It's free falling and gaining this momentum. That momentum is then transported out. Because this particle moves out of the region, let's just say in this direction, it is transported out of that region. OK? That is the essence of an off-diagonal electron pressure term. Meaning that off-diagonal on the pressure, when you say pressure, you have high pressure here, low pressure here, right? You could support E. Uh, God, this thing's bad. Let me uh, find the black one. It works. You could say that E. Just, just from our momentum equation, we could have m v v uh, n t plus um, whatever. Just, just do this uh, minus e e uh, plus uh, minus grad p. This is the electron pressure equation. Okay, um, above is there an m in there? Nope. So we could say that that um, if this is zero, then we have e e equal to minus grad P E, OK, and there's an N. So that is the balance. You can see it's right up there. Take the EN and put it over here. You see this? So we're balancing that electric field with the divergence, the gra divergence of the pressure tensor. But this isn't just a plane divergence. This is a three-dimensional tensor. Okay, so instead of just pushing it with higher pressure and lower pressure, you can't just have the pressure infinitely go up along this x line. It would just go out of control. We're actually transporting the momentum sideways out of that region. And that creates an off diagonal term. So the pressure is you know, PXX, PYY, PZZ. These are your linear pressures. These off diagonal terms. Okay, are basically represent transport of momentum sideways. So you're moving this way and you transport the momentum sideways. Very bizarre, isn't it? So that's a real three dimensional thought. This eliminates the need for resistance in magnetic reconnection. Because our eta is 0. We do not have resistance. We can't call upon it. So is really this off diagonal electron pressure term. Now, I know that's a lot, but this is a brand new finding. It's only two years old. Okay, So this is really 
an understanding, really enhanced our understanding of reconnection. So we could start under, we could start moving forward without having to make up some, you know, for 30, 50 years, we've been making up some resistance. We don't need to make up the resistance. Okay, we, and, and it makes a lot of sense kinetically. You can imagine an electron wandering in, it's not gonna stay in there very long, and it comes out the side. Its momentum, which is picked up in this direction, has been moved this way. Okay, so that's what's balancing it. And it's all hidden in that, those, those off-diagonal terms, meaning the cross terms. And I know that's brain damage, but um, a lot of you gave me blanks. Does this help? Does this help back the explanation of this? All right. So that was our, our big find. And um, we also talked about the Dungey cycle to no end now. And you understand that, that if there is reconnection um, occurring in the, um, uh, the subsolar region, or on the magnetopause, that these field lines have to, they're gonna start building up in the tail. So this is gonna cause a buildup of field lines in the tail, eventually. So it would be nice that, to balance it, you must, for every line that you, re field line you reconnect here, you have to re-reconnect it in the tail, okay? Um, now that's the tail's job. That's what everybody said you must do. But as I described the tail, is it's that stubborn bad boy or bad girl who doesn't want to do what you tell it to do. So the tail says, I'm not. Just because you reconnect it doesn't mean I'm going to. Heck with you. So what happens in the tail is that you start building up magnetic field every time a reconnection occurs, which is more or less, well, relatively more steady than the tail. Actually, it's not that steady up in the front and subsolar region either, but the point is it's more steady than the tail. It starts building up magnetic field line, and you're going to build up tremendous amounts of pressure in the tail due to the fact that you're reconnecting in the subsolar region. So what happens in the tail is, is, is very interesting. The tail is resisting the reconnection for a, a long time. It's, it goes quiet. It says, I am not reconnecting. But the problem is, is that every time another field line comes here, the magnetic field gets higher and the pressure gets higher. Okay? If you're gonna balance pressure in the tail, I should have put a pressure balance screen up. Let me erase this. I'll try to give you a pressure balance in the tail. not to scale. So as you know, the um, magnetic field goes in on the north. So these are this direction, the magnetic field here. And the magnetic field is this direction in the south. And each time you reconnect the field line, you take a, a field line and you push it back into the tail. Whether or not you push its footprint back is up to the Earth. The solar wind is going to push it into the tail. Okay, well, no matter how hard you try, that solar wind's gonna keep pushing these magnetic field lines in the tail. So a little bit later time you get this, and then these move in, and you're, you're starting to crush them now. You're starting to crush these field lines together as time goes on. Every time you get a field line reconnected and it flies back here, you get another one, and another one. So the magnetic pressure, which is B squared over two mu naught, is very high here write this down here. So it's B squared over 2 mu naught here. Now what's in the center? B is 0 in the center. So there is no magnetic pressure, pressure here. This is where the plasma sheet is. This is where all the plasma is. So the particle pressure is high here. This is all particle pressure. 
right here. This is a very hot plasma. It's the ions, the ion temperature is roughly five kilovolts. The electron temperature, you know, that's 50 million degrees. Kelvin, that's pretty hot. The uh, electron temperature is roughly one kilovolt. Densities are roughly around 0 0.1. Doesn't sound very high. That's not very many. But the point is, is that this pressure is balancing this pressure. So what happens is, when you build the pressure up here, you have to squeeze the plasma sheet a little bit, give it a little bit higher density, right? And then it will, you know, stop the magnetic field from touching each other. But the plasma sheet could squirt out two ways. You could go along the field line. That's the problem with these darn field lines. They only can find plasma in, two, in the plane, in two dimensions, not in the third. So eventually, what's going to happen is that this situation can't last that long. So even though the tail, this bad boy or girl, is saying, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to reconnect. Okay. Once it builds up enough, the tail will then break down. Okay, and it starts violently reconnecting. It's much more of a, an explosion here. And all of a sudden, you get excess magnetic pressure somewhere. The, the, the plasma sheet starts squirting out a little bit, right? It loses the, the, this plasma loses its pressure. This is starting to build up too much. Boom. It's going to push in, and you've got the perfect scenario for reconnection again. OK? But the tail, so when it, the tail reconnects, boom, there goes your reconnection. OK? The reconnection is not steady state. The reconnection region itself, the orange blob there, so we'll call this the greater, bigger diffusion region. It's not that big. It's usually very tiny, the diffusion region. Well, let's just call this the bigger reconnection region. Yes, sir? Um, the, basically, the pressure, you have to, there's, there's, uh, you have to transport those field lines into the, into the plasma sheet. But that's one of the questions we don't really ask, can't answer very well, is why does it reconnect? When it does, and why, what, you know, what is it tr triggers this? And yes. Right here. Further in here. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yes. That's one of, I mean, but, but. But do we fully understand? Can we predict exactly when? There, yeah, there are num there are a number of there. Are, no, I I think he's you're you're absolutely correct, and I'm he, he, it's good to have a theorist because he's going to get my x y z directions correct too. I, I desperately need that. But the point I'm going to make is that we don't fully understand when and where and why. 
the reconnection can occur. But there are a lot of good reasons. As he said, as the currency thins and the BZ disappears, and this becomes an, a long extended tail due to the fact that we keep piling up magnetic fields, somewhere there's going to be a region where the, the topology is correct and everything goes. Once it starts, it's pretty much, now this I know, it's pretty much a self-sustaining. This is something that has a little bit of hysteresis to it. In other words, if you could start reconnection, it'll self-sustain itself for a while because the jets cause a vacuum in the center. When you jet out the two sides, you see this? You cause a little bit of a vacuum in the center which pulls the next field line in. Um, that's just a very basic explanation. It's much more complicated than that. But the point I'm making is, is that it basically just, it is much more sporadic. You have quiet periods in the tail where it's very quiet, even though reconnection's going on. And I dare say if we had enough spacecraft that can monitor this, we would start seeing the B start be increasing in the lobes. The lobes are the top and bottom region. Northern and southern lobe is what we call it. In the center is the plasma sheet. The plasma sheet starts thinning. We could see that. We know reconnection is going to happen soon now because BZ goes almost to zero in the plasma sheet. And every, the topology is becoming right. But it still doesn't happen. It will happen where, when, how is an extremely, that's why we want to do more research on reconnection. OK, we need more funding. So <laughs> we don't understand. It's, it, is, it is an important question. It's a very important question. And the very good question. We, this is a, it's a beautiful question because it, it is essentially what we're trying to answer in frontline research. This is a, you know, as much as we. You know, this is a battle of getting more observations, getting more simulations and, un and theoretical understanding, and then trying to apply those and seeing that, you know, guiding us with observations, going back. We do this in tokamak, in, in lab plasmas too. And you know, we were studying reconnection in lab plasmas. So we've been going back and forth, slowly, the circle, of check it out, theorize, more data, theorize has been going on for a while. And we are making slow progress, albeit slow. Well, I'd say rapid. This is, we really, in the last, I would say, 10 years have made a massive amount of progress in reconnection. I think we're getting much better at our understanding and predictability of it. OK, so it's such an important process, but it can be explosive. This is very much what happens with a solar flare. If you think about a solar flare, all of a sudden, boom, there's a flare. It ignites in, 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 in one or two minutes, correct? That's really fast on some solar times. Considering you have scales that are 10 Earth radius, one or two seconds is massively fast. OK? It takes 20 minutes for the solar wind to flow that way. So you've got to understand that this is an explosive process in the tail. This is the explosion. Now, we love this in astrophysics because we could explain jets and we could explain, um, uh, you know, so flares. We could explain because of an explosion, right? The, the substorms. The tokamak people, if people are trying to do controlled fusion, hate this. This is what actually their bane of their existence is. It is reconnection because they're trying to confine the plasma. They don't want reconnection, right? So they do everything they can to keep reconnection from occurring so they could squeeze their plasma and get it to fuse and get it to ignite. Yet, what stops it is reconnection. Once it starts reconnecting, it gets explosive. They go into these thought, they call it a crash. So they're like, oh my god, that damned reconnection. Whereas we're saying, yes, that's cool, you know? So one person's, yeah, that's cool, is the other person's, oh my god, it's wrecking our experiment. So it is the bane of, uh, so it is one of the more important processes in, in plasma physics. Holy, I got something going here. Oh, Adobe wants me to upgrade. God darn. Um, anyway, so I, let, let's go back a slide. Oh no, I've frozen. Thank you, Adobe. No, that's the wrong one.
Any luck, we'll get back to the slides here in a second. All right, so as we said in this situation, um, the, the, recon the tail's getting all set up. It's building up magnetic pressure in the, in the uh, lobes. It's uh, starting to thin, and all of a sudden, at one point, it caves in. This is explosive, and then a reconnection region for it. But the tail is even more stubborn than you think. It doesn't like having the reconnection. Think of it this way. The jet, this jet, which is the jet coming out this way, has nowhere to go. <laughs> it, it's going to crash into Earth. OK, this jet has ah, free fall. OK, so what eventually happens is the entire reconnection region itself doesn't stay still. It retreats down the tail. Do you see this? OK, so I'm going to play that again. Boom, boom, boom. You see how it's going down tail? The reconnection region itself moves down the tail. It doesn't stay in the same place. So you can see how stubborn the tail is. All right, It has to reconnect, but it does it explosively. It does it on its own time. It does it when it wants to, and it, it does it explosively. And not only that, it throws the whole reconnection region down downstream. Yes? Yes, it could be triggered by a change in the pressure, solar wind pressure. It could be triggered by a lot of things. And people have been looking for substorm triggers in the data in the solar wind for years. There have been so many statistical studies of what triggers substorms. Remember, there's a 20-minute delay, though, between the nose and the tail. So a lot of people even shift the data by 20 minutes. And, and, and the answer is we don't have one single thing. We do know that when the clock angle of the solar wind goes southward, that 20 minutes later, you're more likely to have a reconnection. Not exactly, but more likely. Why? Because the reconnection is starting to, to speed up. When, it, when, when the magnetic field goes southward in the magnetopause, the reconnection is much faster, so the tail is more likely to reconnect 20 or 30 minutes later. When the, eye, the interplanetary magnetic field, or the solar wind magnetic field, goes northward, that slows down reconnection tremendously. So you, it's much, less, much like, less likely 20 or 30 minutes later the tail's going to reconnect. That, that still doesn't tell us exactly what's triggering this. So the trigger of a substorm is a massive topic that has been looked at inside and out. So um, let's take a break right now. Um, is this right for our break? Yeah. It's quarter after. And um, we'll take a five-minute uh, break, and then we'll be back in a few minutes. Start, at, start up at uh, 920. I haven't made up any um, um, really good jokes about theorists, so I'm going to have to do that. <laughs> the main thing is X, Y, and Z with theorists. You, 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 know, you guys have Z, X, and Y in any damn direction you want. That's the thing. <laughs> They're good for you. I know. I, I, you know, I started out as a theorist. I know. You said that. <laughs> It's true, but it's the same. It's the same thing with theorists. You see, I don't. I'm very gullible when it comes to simulations. Yeah, yeah. So don't be. Who, who do I believe? I, I believe a certain set of people because other people say simulate something. You go, you know, I did. We did. We were one of the first to do open boundary picks. One to me, one day. Okay, a long time ago. Open boundary vast last off in picks. And um, that's why I started working with Marty and Dave in the early Montana instruments. Much, much easier to get funding. And um, but um, um, I I learned I can do anything I want. And well, some people would just people talk, but, you know, one of the yeah. things that I do is that you know, I straddle. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I do as a person is I tend to think that this is a little bit different. It's always the boundary condition. 
issues. We we go and we could tweak the boundary conditions and get different answers. And that's a really important issue. Yes. They always do. They always do. Well, this is the collision list part. Yeah. I have an, I, I, yeah. The part that really relates to overlearning. Good. Yeah. I tried to stick to reconnection because you guys did reconnection, so I thought sure. it was a good theme. Crosses all the disciplines. It does. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Oh, yeah, MMS has helped, but. I mean, come on. There's been a lot of MMS is sort of sorting out which theory, you know, works. All right. Well, I'll slowly begin because not everybody's back, so I'll just, you know, yammer on slowly. Um, a lot of people are claiming, you know, MMS. I don't want to make too many claims, but MMS has been very good, basically because it has sorted out which theories are, more, you know, more dominant in the collisionless regime in which theories are not so good. So we don't go down the wrong path. That's what experiments are very good for. We're making progress. We, you have a lot of smart people trying this idea, this idea, this idea, this idea. Which one's the best one to go? Well, it turns out that experiment will tell you it's this path. Okay, And so it really helps us focus our research on the right things, in particular for collisionless reconnection. So. Let's uh, review where we were. I want to talk about this magnetic reconnection in the tail, but I want to mention the tail word, what do we call the tail word retreat. By retreat, the, the actual X line itself is retreating down the tail. Now, you, you know, intuitively it makes a little bit of sense, although I'm not, I'm, I'm going I'm to be cautioning you not to listen to this explanation. But just imagine it's pushing off the Earth, because one of the jets is banging in the Earth and the other isn't. That's the way I thought about it at first. All wrong. But it makes more sense that way. But the, the point is, we in the MMS community, as, as experimentalists said, this is great. Because you know how hard it would be to find reconnection down in the tail? You're, you're 25 Earth radius down is where it often occurs. I have this occurring 15, but it often occurs more like 25, 26, 27, something like that. You know how hard we find, but if it moves, we could find it better. We just have to sit a satellite down at, say, 25 RE and wait for the blob to hit us. So we said, ha, huh, that's what we're going to do. We're going to put a satellite back here as far back as we can get it. right? Somewhere around here. So here's MMS just sitting there. Now remember the time scale. MMS moves at around half a kilometer a second out there. It's just not moving. When you have an orbiting satellite that's in a highly eccentric orbit like that, it slows way down at the apogee. It almost comes to a stop and then zips around the Earth. So the four satellites just sit there 
for long periods of time, almost 12 hours, we'll sit out there. And then we do an orbit every three days. But, but for most of that orbit, we are just sitting out way down tail. The four satellites are so close together, you couldn't see a separation on this scale. So we wait for the reconnection to go by us. We wait for that moment right there. You see what I'm saying? Right when it goes right through our satellites. And so I'm going to ask you, here's a quick question. You're looking at many, many days worth of data. You have gigabytes, terabytes of data. How would you find a reconnection region in MMS data? BZ reversal, is that what you said? Absolutely. BZ reversal. What else reverses? Take a look at the, oh, maybe I gave that away in my slides, did I? Yeah, I gave it away. Oh, boy. Come on, you guys, you're just not reading the slides. Um, uh, when, right here, when the reconnection re region is earthward of MMS, BZ is in this direction. It's, 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 it's northward. Okay? And, B, okay, we're sitting in a southward. Okay, BZ will turn southward where we are. Okay? The ion flow where we are is tailward. It's in minus x. X direction is towards the sun. That's x. So the flow is in the minus x direction. The magnetic field, the z component of it, is in the minus direction. So if we all of a sudden find ourselves minus v flow, minus BZ, we know that we might be hit by a reconnection site. It's coming at us. OK? All of a sudden, the minus BZ and the minus V flow come at us. We then will get hit by this reconnection region, and we'll know it. But then we'll see a reversal. Now, we're earthward of the reconnection, so our flow is going to be plus V. And the, and the magnetic field we should see, because we're earthward of it, is in the plus. So BZ, the Z component of the magnetic field, which is this direction, goes from minus to plus, And the V direction, the velocity in the X direction, goes from minus to plus. OK, so let's get some data. I want you to see if you could. Well, I already marked them all. But um, so let's, let's see if you could see where the reconnection region is. <laughs> This is going to kill you guys. Obviously, it's in the center. OK. Um, so this is a reconnection site on MMS. So take a look. Now, the red component is BZ. So look for the red in the magnetic field. You see it's negative here? Negative, negative, negative. Boom, it goes positive. OK, forget about this going negative again. That, that's a wiggle. All right? Velocity. Vx is blue. So in the magnetic field plot, whenever you look at MMS data, look at the red line in the magnetic field. Trick one. Trick two, look at the blue line in the velocity. OK? Red line in the magnetic field goes plus, minus to plus. Blue line goes minus to plus. OK? So we immediately zoom into this event, which I have already done. And there we got it. We got the magnetic reconnection region just right here. Look at all the nice things that happen in the reconnection region. You get the jets. You get the big Hall electric fields. You get the Hall magnetic fields. And you get the J dot E, all which we predicted, all which uh, Princeton people have, have told us. This is exactly what the simulations are telling us. So we are able to, well, some simulations, we are able to verify this region. There is the reconnection right there. This is one of the best captures MMS made. Now remember, it's not always the case that we'll get the reconnection when a blob flies over us. Right? We could be the satellite. I'm a satellite sitting here. That blob can go this way or below me. It's less likely to go to the side because it is a line. Right, so the, it's a line coming at me, right? So, so it's a whole X line coming at me. So, but it could go above me or below me, or maybe it is to one side or the other. Okay, so it's not always the case. In fact, it's very rare. It's only one in a thousand that we're actually going to get the reconnection region. 
So we have to look at a thousand of these reversals. You get that reversal, the V reversal and the BZ reversal. You'll get that a lot, but you won't always hit the reconnection region. You might be a near miss. Okay? Near miss. A miss. Okay, not a, a near hit. I never liked that. Now airlines do that to you, a near miss. What is a near miss? Okay? I mean, that's, it's got to either be a near hit or not. <laughs> a near miss means you actually hit it. <laughs> I nearly missed it. Um, so anyway, the long and the short of it is that's how you identify reconnection in, in the tail. So let's take a look at this very slowly again. You could see blue is negative and, and Z is negative. The red line is negative. B is negative blue. We hit it right here. We have the large current here. This is the current sheet in the, in the in a thin current sheet, very thin. It's, it's very quick and thin. So we've thinned the tail almost down to the ion diffusion lengths, the diffusion lengths that we expected. Very, very large Hall E field, and J dot E is starting to rattle tremendously. All right, so we, we actually got it. And then in the aftermath of reconnection, we, start, we see BZ positive. We're seeing the jet reversal come at us. And, and all of a sudden, we know that it's past us. We are now earthward of this reconnection site. So how do we know that this reconnection retreated? We have got, statistically, we could watch this happen over and over again. Cluster and earlier satellites have seen this. We finally deduced that, that the reconnection is not sitting still. It's explosive, and it retreats tailward. Okay, So we got hit here. So now we could do the same. MMS is snapping massive amounts of data in this. So this is a 2018 paper that I'm going to show you about magneto, magneto tail reconnection. And um, these are the ion, electron distributions in the raw. Here they are again. Remember the idea that in the electron diffusion region, well, everywhere else in the world, these electron distributions are round in the perpendicular, perpendicular plane because electrons go around in circles. So you should have as many going this way, as this way, as this way, as this way. So they should be circular. They become very non-circular. Okay, same thing. Same idea. We start seeing the, um, uh, we actually measured the, the reconnection electric field in this one. It's the first time ever somebody's measured a reconnection electric field in the, in the reconnection, the electron diffusion region. And we snap the electrons at the same time. Same thing. Off diagonal gradient of the electron pressure. OK, so we are able to verify that in the tail, which has got vastly different, not vastly, but significantly different plasma conditions than the subsolar region, we didn't need this any kind of anomalous resistivity or any kind of resistivity whatsoever. It's just simply an off diagonal term electron pressure. Okay, so that's where we're coming from on, on the uh, from MMS. So we've verified a lot of these symptoms. Now, the story is not over. Just because we could find two very clean events that ver validate somebody's theory doesn't mean that's the end of the story. We have got a lot of work to do. We found 30 events in the subsolar region. We have about five a handful of events in the tail. That's all we have. And we've got to study these and understand them quite a bit. And something surprising happened, though. OK, now let me explain a little bit about substorms. Once this process begins, and this is five hours of data now, on the other plots, I'm showing you very short time scale. I mean, this is only a minute of data as the blob goes by us. And this is only a few seconds. Do you see that? It just flies by us, and we only have the electron diffusion region so small that when it goes through us, it goes, we, we have two seconds. We have two seconds to snap it. OK? So I'm now going to show you the bigger picture on this, huge picture on this. This is five hours of data. Um, not sure how many of you understand all this, but the top plot are electrons, 
And the color represents how much energy flux of electrons there is. I mean, it counts, really. And this is, uh, 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 this vertical axis is, is um, uh, energy in electron volts. And this is time. And this is uh, not five hours, three hours. Three hours of data. OK. Um, how long does the Dungey cycle take? 20 minutes, 40 minutes, or something? Interestingly, about every 40 minutes, we get one of these crossings where v, y, you know, Vx goes from negative to positive, negative positive. I'm not showing B because it's much harder to show here. Negative to positive, negative to positive, negative to positive. We have five reconnection events going on here. You see that? This is known as a substorm. One reconnection event is kind of nice, but they come in bundles. Okay, So you get that one reconnection event, but it happens over and over and over again. Because the, probably the solar winds turn southward. So you can see the tail is really quiet here. Look at how quiet it is on, on early time. This is, this is basically, see how B is just going straight back in the y, x direction? BZ is a little bit smaller. It gets smaller and smaller, then boom. We get into the first reconnection site, possibly. OK. So this just shows you that whole theory. Remember I tell you the tail's very quiet, just sitting there. Nothing's happening. And then all of a sudden, it starts getting squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. So it's getting the squeeze here. You see how BZ is slowly lowering? BX is slowly increasing. Do you see that? BX starts building up. X is the X direction. We're building up the flux in the tail. The, the subsolar region is giving us more magnetic field and more magnetic field. And then we can't take it anymore. OK? The bad boy, the bad girl can't take it. So it allows a reconnection of it. Allows, it's not clear what's going on here, but allows another one, another one, another one, another one, another one. But these are separated by about a uh, half an hour. OK? So that's about the Dungey cycle time. It takes about a half an hour. So this is releasing that a half an hour of buildup of magnetic field in a, in a minute or something. You see that? We're releasing all of that magnetic field buildup in about a minute. And then it keeps building up. And the nose keeps building us up. And we do it again. And we do it again. And we do it again. These are called substorms, or storms if they get incredibly violent. OK, so yes, sir. No, no. We have, the magnetometers on MMS have, are directional. Um, I refer you to Russell et al., Chris, Chris Russell's flux, flux gate magnetometry. We could, we could get a vector. And we could get a vector electric fields. We could get vector velocity. So it's the key with MMS. It has extremely good instruments on it. So the basic idea is, and by the way, in the second one, is the one where I didn't show you the EDR of that one, but it has a very similar electron diffusion. We actually got hit by the electric. So these were misses, all misses. Okay. In fact, if you look at this one very carefully, when this velocity shifted, B was we were um, BZ was B BX was negative. Okay. So look not just at the red part of B, but this is BX. So if Bx is negative, that means that we're down here somewhere. Do you see that? Because this would be positive B. If Bx is positive, we're in the northern lobe. If Bx is negative, we're in the southern lobe. So we want to look for a third thing that you look for is Bx to be about 0. Okay. So that's what you also want to see. So you can see we're first, which lobe are we in? Bx is negative. Southern. Then we're southern. Then we go northern. OK? Northern lobe. So we're actually wiggling around in here. Because we're not wiggling, the tail's flapping. You see that? Yours rotating, and the tail's flapping like this. It does that, like a flag. So we could find ourselves north or south crossing. So the first time we had a, 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 a flow 
reversal on a blob go past, we were too far south. It went over top of us. Missed it. We got smack dab hit right here. See that? Right on this one. This one is a very interesting one. Okay. This one is a surprise. Where the heck is the reconnection region in there? It looks like we reconnected 500 times. Doesn't it? This is an absolute observation of turbulent reconnection. The whole plasma tail exploded into turbulence at this point. And so now we have a whole new problem. How do you deal with turbulent reconnection? Where's the EDR? What's the diffusion? What's going on? What's happening? OK, this is now under tremendous, we're on, this is under a lot of study. But also, I want you to look at the electron and ion temperatures. Here are the energies, the electrons. You look at the blue green, lower blue green boundary to find what the temperature is. And that's around a kilovolt here. Boom, they get heated. The electrons gone, have gone from their one kilovolt, which is around 10 million degrees, to roughly around 50 to 100 million degrees. Okay, Ions, they left the scale. They left our instrument. We, don't, we, don't, we can't measure it any higher than, well, I, we can. I have to get a different instrument than 25 kilovolts. They went from around 5 kilovolts to 50 kilovolts. So, wow, did we get heating. Did things toast up? So can reconnection be massively turbulent is the second question. OK. Now, that's going to cause you a lot of brain damage if we get into turbulence. So I'm not going to do it. And besides that, I've only got about 20 minutes left. So it's just food for thought. We have a whole new scope of research. And I think turbulent reconnection is going to be one of the ones in the future. If you really want to do something that's going to contribute to future, it will be turbulence and reconnection. I would say that even a, even a theorist would agree with that. Did you have a question? Yes. Yes, it is. Pretty much. But it is kind of interesting that it's about the same time as the Dungey cycle. I mean, it's on the same order magnitude. It looks almost periodic there, but I, I, it's never very cleanly periodic. It always is kind of splotchy, like the next one will happen in 10 minutes, then 20 minutes later, and then 40 minutes, and then five, 15 minutes. You, know, you, know, you could only scratch your head as to why it happened when. But this is the nature of a substorm, then, is a series, I'll go back, of these events. Is, and, and, and it doesn't have to actually quiet down in between. But we started with a quiet tail, right? You saw that early on. And then all of a sudden, somewhere, reconnection forms. This blob goes down the tail, but then it happens again. OK? And over and over again. So we're seeing more and more blobs form and come down the tail. And another blob form earthward of us and come past us. And another blob form earthward of us and come past us. And so on. OK. Pardon me? The explosion of turbulence in the reconnection? Yeah, the basically, that's a really good question. I think reconnection and turbulence, they're, they're linked. We see often turbulence associated with reconnection and reconnection points inside of turbulent regions. So it's almost like a cycle where reconnection causes turbulence, and turbulence causes small scale reconnection events inside of it, which cause more turbulence. You see what I'm saying? And, and, and so on. What starts the whole process, I don't know. What? When it gets over when the driver, which is the magnetic e energy, you're taking B squared over 2 mu naught and reducing it. So you must be taking energy and putting it into the J dot E in the tail. When that ends, when you run out of magnetic energy, then the turbulence is going to die. And that's what we think is going on. So the main driver of this turbulence, okay, for those of you who know much about turbulence, think of a waterfall. The water can go down a river very cleanly, right? And, and the river's happy, and it's a nice, pretty stream, right? 
because it could absorb the gravitational energy in a laminar fashion. Once it goes over a waterfall, you're giving the water too much gravitational energy for it to absorb in a laminar fashion. So it breaks into turbulence. You ever see a bottom of a waterfall? And the turbulence takes, makes bigger eddies and smaller eddies and teeny eddies and so that the viscosity in the water can absorb all that energy and, and as a form of heat. Okay. And then, it, once it runs out of the gravitational energy, it forms a river again in a nice laminar situation. So when you overdrive something, a fluid, if you overdrive it, you will get, it can break into turbulence. That means it can absorb the energy in, in, in rapid enough in a laminar form, rapidly enough. If you're giving it too much energy too fast. And what's happening, we think, in this turbulent reconnection region is we're giving it too much energy too fast. So here, um, you can actually see a little bit of turbulence break out here. And then it's just massive turbulence. And again, this is a very turbulent result event. First one seemed more laminar. So the, the basically, we're giving it too much magnetic. See how the magnetic energy is getting huge here in the tail? And then it stops being turbulent once we get down back to normal tail magnetic field. So something was piling up a huge amount of magnetic field energy, the subsolar region, okay, which acts completely independently. You see, the magneto tail must take whatever the subsolar region gives it and deal with it. Okay? Yes? Right. Well, I think what happened in this situation was this was the blob flowing by us. And yeah, that boundary is interesting. Whether it's a Z boundary or a Y boundary, we don't know, or an X boundary. But we're going to look at that very carefully. It's a very good observation, very sharp observation on your part. It's hard to explain everything in these data. But I would, I think this is wide open. This is, this is front line. We're in the front trenches now of research. OK, so this is a, um, a, an event that still needs a lot of explanation. But the fact, the bigger picture on this, that we have these blobs go over and over again. Um, now, one of the things about aurora, I wanted to spell myth one. The aurora is not from electrons that come from solar wind. They are from electrons that come from the tail. They are earthbound electrons that are coming back in from the tail. They're generally not direct solar wind electrons, OK? The, what happens is the Earth is on this open, closed boundary in this tail reconnection because this is a hard one to explain. But when you look at the Earth in this area, and you look at the actual footprints of, of the magnetic field lines, almost all of them in this auroral open, closed boundary go back to the tail. Even the ones up forward go back to the tail. So almost all of these lines, except for a very few in the front, go back to the tail. Okay. So they are not direct entry of solar wind. They are maybe solar wind electrons, maybe earthbound electrons. We can't tell the difference. But they are basically coming in from the tail. So when the reconnection happens in the tail, is when the aurora light up. Okay, that has been known for years. That is called an auroral substorm. Same name, tail substorm, auroral substorm. They're the same phenomena, because the manifestation of these substorms in the tail is a massive amount of pointing flux and energy and electron energy flux coming right at the auroral zone. Okay, so it is the electron energy flux. And all the energy flux coming in during the reconnection, it's associated often with that jet and the rebound of that jet bashing into the Earth, causing massive amounts of pointing flux energy. Because all that B squared over 2 mu naught that's being annihilated in the tail has to go somewhere. Some of it goes into heating the electrons. Some of it goes into heating ions. Some of it goes into accelerating the ion jets. A lot of it just gets ejected down the tail. But some of it goes right into Earth. Okay, and so it's that, that push right into Earth 
that it's going to cause these things. Okay. And these are the light up on the sky of the world oval. It is, I've seen so many times in so many places where people say, oh, the solar wind, electrons come ripping in. And that, that I, I understand why you all, all might think that because that's been written down so many times. But it's not. It's really a much, much more complex. Yes, the energy comes from the solar wind. Yes, it's all solar wind driven. Yes, everything. But it's a much more complex process. The electrons were, are coming like this. Okay. Even the ones on the day side are coming, well, not from directly in the back of the tail, but they're coming from out over here. Do you see this? Everything is swept back. If your hair is all swept back, the, the front here here is in the back. So think of the magnetic field lines as like your hair being all swept back. Okay. So anything that follows your hair along, even if it hits the front of your head, is not coming from the front. It's coming from the back of your head. I don't have much hair. I wish I had longer hair. Somebody who has longer hair can do this better. Okay? So the, the, the idea is that it's coming from the back. All right, now what the aurora are just beautiful. Okay, well, this is this is something the general public and a lot of us can get a hold of. We could see it. You know, how many of you have seen Aurora, by the way, directly? Only one, two, three, four. Only four of you? You guys all must be like tropical, you know, you all, you, you all like tropical beaches. Yeah, okay. Uh, um, go to Alaska. Okay, go to Canada. Go to one of those cold places. Um, yeah, yeah. It's very, very interesting. These are beautiful dancing green curtains of light that you'll see. And if you go out, but by the way, you got to go to Alaska in the winter. You can't see them in the summer because the sun doesn't set. So you got to go in the winter. Like January is a really good time. <laughs> 70 below. Go to the top of a place in Fairbanks called Cleary Summit where a lot of people go to see it. And you can just stand there and watch those forever, you know. And and it, they're beautiful. They're really, really wonderful. Now you could see, in fact, a lot of information which you could figure out. See those striations in the aurora, like this and this. You see the vertical lines there. It's not in the picture. What, are, what do you think is causing that? What are those lines? They're magnetic field lines. The aurora is actually lighting up the magnetic field line. Okay. These are open closed boundaries. Now, we'd expect just one curtain, honestly. We get lots of them. Just to show you, the nature throws us curveballs every time. God darn it, why couldn't they just give us one curtain and then we could figure it out and it would fit our model? But no. <laughs> they give us three. All right. That is an unanswered question why it breaks up into such structure. But let's not get into the details. Let's go back to the simplest picture. You can see the, the curtains of um, Aurora following this open closed boundary where the rebound is coming in from the tail. It's being heavily driven from the tail. And then it lights up and just bursts all over the sky because you have a reconnection event and then quiets back down to a quieter region. And then it will light up and burst all across the sky again. Guess what's happening? Substorm reconnect. So when the reconnection happens, it just gets messier than anything. There's bursts all over the sky, and then it will go back to a much more quieter situation. Because even though the, there's no direct reconnection, the aftermath of that old reconnection site is still pumping energy into the aurora. So the aurora are basically telling us what's going on in the magnetotail, primarily. And this is a picture from the space shuttle. Um, just to show you that they do have curtain and they do swirl around and make a halo around the uh, north pole of the, the Earth. Um, so the, the real idea here is that the energy enters all along this the, the, the flanks, the northern and southern tail. If you calculate E cross B, that's where the pointing flux is coming in. Not all that pointing flux is going to go to Aurora. That's the buildup of magnetic field and the release and the heating, ejection down the tail, everything. But that's where the energy comes from. 
Guess what enables this? Without the subsolar reconnection, none of this could happen. Okay, that's the amazing thing. That that teeny little ant in the subsolar region causing the reconnection, the electron diffusion, none of this could happen. There'd be no pointing blocks coming into the Earth. Well, maybe a little bit, but from different types of interactions. That pointing flux gets into the tail and then goes into the auroral zone. Now, there's a different way of looking at it. And um, hang on a second. I've got to see how much time I have left. Oh, geez. I have five minutes left. All right. So we're going to skip a few of these things. Basically, the solar, those footprints on the Earth have to move. Right, due to the fact that we're doing it. Just the motion of those footprints causes the quiet aurora. The massively strong aurora is caused by substorm. That's the short and the long and the short of it. OK, now where does that electrons, now you might think that electrons are just coming in and being uh, uh, lighting up the um, um, Earth. Let me just show you a few more nice pictures of aurora. Um, this is what it looks like from space. I think that's an artist imager. It's a universal process. You see them on Jupiter and Saturn. So this aurora is not something that just, just normally happens. Um, let me talk about what, what the light is coming from, um, just so you understand this. The light, that green light, is 557.7 nanometers. The reason I had to hesitate is I'm an old angstrom guy. It's 5577. Okay, angstroms. So it's 55, 557.7 nanometers. And we then go and look up in our chemistry books and everything. What? It's oxygen. It's an oxygen line. Oxygen green line, it's called. So what is going on, we do deduce backwards, is that high energy electrons or energetic electrons, 5, 1, 5, 10 kilovolts are coming in and they're smacking into an oxygen atom on top of our Earth and exciting it. Okay, This then de-excites. Okay, once the, ener the electron whacks it, throws off one of the electrons, it then will find another electron. When the electron comes back in, it's exactly 557 nanometers. 0.7 nanometers, and that is the oxygen green line. So that is the dominant effect of the aurora. So what you're seeing is almost like an old cathode ray tube, where an electron beam is exciting your screen. Okay, only this time it's it's 5577 line. See why electrons are green? Um, all right. So the point that the, the, the second point that we have to make, so that is a, a 5577, you see the green line up there? That is our primary um, um, excited state of oxygen. So that's what you're seeing. There are all sorts of ultraviolet lines. There's a 295 line. You can't see that. That's pretty bright, though. So if you want to look at the Earth's aurora in ultraviolet, you'd look at 295. Okay. Your eyes can't detect that. doesn't mean it's not there. Um, so you could do a lot of chemistry with this, but this is the basis behind any aurora. In Jupiter, you're exciting hydrogen lines, so you just basically you're seeing lime and alpha and hydrogen emissions coming out because the electrons are exciting hydrogen and helium, not oxygen, as in the case of Earth. That's our primary excitation. We also have some nitrogen lines um, that we will see because our atmosphere is main, um, uh, top side ionosphere is mainly oxygen and nitrogen. I know I only have three minutes. Um, basically, the bottom line with Aurora that we have found out through a number of missions is that the acceleration is not just solar wind coming in, that there is a parallel electric field or an alphane wave that is re-accelerating these electrons as they become near Earth. The reason being, is that to drag these footprints across the top, you need currents. And the currents have to be carried along the field lines by electrons. These, these orange lines are electric field potentials. And what we have found out is that the acceleration is actually near Earth. It's just above us, about one RE up off our surface. That's where the electrons are coming in. They're 
hot electrons around a kilovolt, they fall into a parallel electric field and just get fired right at the Earth. Why is that parallel electric field set up? Where does that energy come from? It all comes from the magnetosphere. And the parallel electric field sets up due to the mirror force. The mirror force is trying to stop that current from flowing in the Earth because the electrons try to flow to the Earth. They can't get there because they keep mirroring. So the parallel electric field, nature's so smart, sets up and fires the electrons in so it can complete the current loop. Now, the current loop, there's a downward current region in the aurora, but that's where electrons go anti-earthward. You don't see that. Because it's really easy for electrons to go from the Earth out outward. They're light, right? There's no mirror force. There's nothing stopping them. So it's a lot more complex than one thinks about the auroral zone. Um, and we have tremendous amounts of data on that. And I was going to show you some of this and the pointing flux, um, but I've got two minutes left. And so I just want to point out. Um, da, 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 um, one, one, this would take me more than two minutes. There's a nice piece of physics in that. I'm going to end, I'm, I'm going to end probably with this slide. Um, the same electric field that accelerates electrons down to the ionosphere will accelerate ions out to the magnetosphere. So when we fly above the auroral acceleration region, which we are doing here, we get literally a beam of ions coming right out from the Earth. OK? And that's the same place where you could see the electrons going down towards the Earth. OK, but it depends whether you're above or below this acceleration region. So the aurora has a discrete acceleration region. And there are not just one, but nature always does this. There are like 10 of them. OK, so you could actually be in between and get both electrons going down and ions going up with half the energy, for example. And it's beautiful. You could watch it. If you get close to Earth, there are all electrons coming down and very few ions going up. And then when you get above that, you see the ions going up with high energy and the electrons just kind of at low energy. In the middle, you see them both with energy, half the energy. So this is kind of cool. Um, there was a test we could make, though, a theoretical test. We could integrate the electric field, the perpendicular electric field, as we move along. And I'm not going to go into the details, but this was one of the most beautiful tests that's ever been made in the aurora. And that should equal the ion beam energy. Because it's the integral V dot the L is the voltage. And the voltage has to be conserved. So through that, we did the integral V dot the L. And that's the black line here and laid it on. That was a very classic. We nailed it, paper. So this is back in the 90s. But this is one of those classic, we really nailed the auroral acceleration years ago as being a near Earth process. So there's a lot of evidence. Here's the amazing thing about it. Paralectric fields don't exist in MHD, do they? Uh, I'm going to ask him top. Professor Bardachar. Do parallel electric fields exist in MHD? <laughs> Not in ideal MHD. OK, so th there was a huge fight. This is why I love this, this paper and this, 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 um, this uh, there was a massive fight. You should have seen people throwing tomatoes at us when we said that there were parallel electric fields. All the astrophysicists and all, it can't happen. Tomato, right? Right? When we showed this, which was absolutely definitive evidence that we had a parallel electric field, it was like, oh. All the good scientists went, oh, and went back to the drawing board. A few of them actually kept throwing tomatoes at us. <laughs> but anyway, this is how science works. You have to break some kind of myth sometimes. But the aurora is a near Earth process. It's driven by energy, pointing flux coming in from the tail. Okay, and you'll see the substorms burst in aurora when the tail reconnects. So the substorms aurora, when you, you should see an aurora when there's a reconnection event. It just goes all over the sky. It's just pieces all over and dancing and moving. And then it goes quiet again. That's your quiet tail. And then it goes bam and bursts all over the place. If you go to Alaska, you could see the substorms. 
a person, um, the Alaskans know this from a Shanakasukupu, right? I mean, he's known this for 50 years, he's been telling people this. And he's right, it's tail reconnection. So the long and short of it is there's a tremendous amount of research to do. And there's a tremendous amount of interest in solar physics and magnetospheric physics. But you have to learn all the depths. You've got to learn how to model the thing in a large scale. Back of the envelope, make sure that things are working. And then you have to sometimes go and say, OK, we're not going to use MHD. We're going to use two fluid theory to try to get a more accurate approach. And then you sometimes have to go, hey, I've got to use complete pick theory and kinetic theory and I really to understand it. So you have to be able to grab the tools that you need to answer the question. You can't just be one tool. Okay? And it's sometimes really good to look at other things like Jupiter. I look at Jupiter quite a bit because I've learned a lot about which processes at Earth are, are just peculiar to Earth and which are more universal. Aurora are universal. All right, so this is a rich field. You guys, wide open. This is the age of astrophysics and space exploration. We're the beginning of it. Do you realize that? We're right in the middle of it. We didn't know any of this stuff 20, 30 years ago. And now we're knowing it. So there's a lot of, lot of work to go. And this is the age. People are going to look back at this era, I think, and say, wow, the production in space plasmas and astrophysics was amazing at that time. That's because we discovered a telescope. It's like when the telescope was discovered, all of a sudden we started learning a lot about the stars, right? We, our spacecraft are our telescope. The fact that we can get there, go to space, and see things is, is just bursting with information. So I really encourage you to go on with this field and, and, and definitely learn a lot of theory and definitely learn how to, if you can, build instruments. That's the fun part. I love that. All right. Um, I should end. Any more questions? Yes. Oh, yeah, there, there's a paper out on that um, now. The, the reddish purple lines are from nitrogen. OK, they're lower energy and they're lower down in the atmosphere. And they, they represent different penetration lengths, lengths of electrons. That happens to be an instability in near the plasmasphere, where there's a big gradient. And I didn't explain the plasmasphere, so um, that's way in towards the Earth. It's a four or five Earth radius, five Earth radius way in, there's an instability there that can drive that steep, which is a more vertical aurora. Um, there are also ion aurora, proton aurora. They're much dimmer, but we could pick those out. And when you see red aurora, which you can see sometimes in Colorado, um, or uh, that's more or less a more like a 10 eV electron population just immersed in the nitrogen. So lots of different ways of making all right, thank you guys. One more question. Oh, that's not true. This is fast anyway. There's only one of those. But we use all four, almost all the papers. I'm, I, I, I beg to differ. <laughs> when, when I write a paper on MMS, I almost always use, well, sometimes I use one, but I use a main one to show the example. But we use all four. If all four don't show the same thing or similar pattern, then we get we 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 get derivatives and everything on this. All right, it's been a good morning. It's been a fun talking to you guys. Hope you learned something. I hope I was somewhat useful. And enjoy your break, and enjoy the rest of this. You should reconnect. You are a very correct